Hello and welcome to the Cambridge Union. If you're a new member and you've just joined, please remember to get your um, mug and term card outside after the event. If you're here for a competitive debating workshop, that's upstairs in the library. There's been some confusion, so I thought I should clarify. Um, I'm very excited for this event. I imagine you are too. I'm honoured to be joined by the wonderful Robert Harris, in conversation with the brilliant Claire Jackson, winner of the 2022 Wilson History Prize. Robert will be discussing his new novel, Acts of Oblivion, an epic journey across continents set during the 1660s, following two men on the run and wanted for the murder of Charles I. Without further ado, I'll leave it to the experts. Thank you so much, Robert and Claire. Thank you very much. Um, my instructions, so I hope they tally with your expectations, are that we might talk for 40 minutes and then we'll um, open it up to sort of questions. Um, so hopefully if someone, if 40 minutes elapse and I don't notice someone, please tell me. Um, but thank you so much, Robert, for Pleasure. coming to Cambridge to talk to everybody. Um, it's an obvious question, but I am presuming that not everyone has read every word yet because this is a very recent book. So first of all, would you just like to tell us a little bit about the book sure. and also what piqued your interest in the 17th century? Yes. Thank you very much for uh, coming. Um, is this working? Or maybe I'll just speak loudly. Um, uh, yes, I was on that much abused thing, Twitter, um, a couple of years ago, and there was a reference to something called the greatest manhunt of the 17th century. And I was scrolling through, and I scrolled back up to it. I thought it was sounded interesting. And uh, I followed the thread, and it was about the um, hunt for the regicides, uh, the people who'd signed Charles I's death warrant or had acted as judges at his trial, uh, scores of them who were hunted down under the terms, the provisions of the Act of Oblivion, the uh, legislation that was introduced in 1660 when Charles II came to the throne, which was a sort of truth and reconciliation uh, um, attempt um, and it was indeed um, it, 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 it was effective even Cromwell's sons were left unmolested but not the regicides and so I thought I read about it and I thought I should invent a regicide um, hunter um, because it was a hunt a manhunt without a manhunter and uh, so I read lots of dry as dust tomes about uh, the structure of government, um, how the country was run, to try and locate where such a person might be. There must have been someone who had the ports closed and intercepted the mail and interrogated the prisoners. Uh, and I located him eventually in the Privy, thought he'd be in the Privy Council as a subcommittee dealing with the regicides. So I invented him, and then I thought, well, I should uh, focus on a couple of the regicides he's hunting. And the two most interesting, by far, it seemed to me, were Colonel Edward Whaley and Colonel William Goff, a father-in-law and son-in-law who fled to New England and were on the run for more than a decade. I was very fond of my late father-in-law, but I wouldn't have wanted to go on the run with him. So <laughs> I thought that this would be an interesting uh, dynamic. It's the first novel you've written set in the 17th century, am I right? Yeah. Yes. What surprised you about it, or what, had you ever thought of writing a novel set? Because this is your 15th novel, yes. yeah? So, ever thought of...? I never, I never know where I'm going to set a book. I, I was astonished to find that I'd written a book about Pompeii. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my editor was even more astonished, actually, when I said I wanted to write a novel about Pliny the Elder. She said, can't we at least make it Pliny the Younger? Um, but the, uh, I uh, and was amazed to find myself writing a novel about the Dreyfus Affair. It's, it's, I go wherever, you know, there's a story that I find interesting, characters that I find interesting, and the political backdrop, and of course there's nothing more interesting really than the English Civil War which isn't much written about in popular fiction or in popular culture generally. There have been uh, a spate of books, non-fiction books such as yours just recently but no, very few novels. And I mean I think historians are sometimes too precious to sort of say why, you know, that, that why they get interested in what they do, that there is some kind of present thing. Uh, you know, I actually think it's, it's fairly obvious that the sorts of things that, you know, interest you as a historian must be because of things in the air currently at the moment. But did you 
having just approached the 17th century for the first time, did you see sort of parallels that sort of spoke to you in this? I mean, it is about a very yes. divided nation at the time, and, and it is the most turbulent period in our history. Well, I've learned to not push parallels. I yeah, think yeah. Hilary Mantel was very right about that when she said it's, a, it's bad to mm. sort of just use, to distort the past, mm. to mm. just try. So what I try to, I just write mm. the truth as far as I can. And then, as you say, of course, you've been drawn to a subject partly because there are, even subconsciously, things about it that appeal to you. Um, I mean, I, I was definitely interested in the notion of government and retribution, mm. Uh, the aftermath of a civil war um, and using that as a means of, of writing about the civil mm. war. There was a moment when I thought, well, maybe I should just write some great trilogy about the, you know, about the events from 1642 onwards. Uh, but I realised that would be very stodgy, I think. And this, this gave me the opportunity to move around. I, it's so, such a complicated story and religion is so important in it, and that's quite difficult for a modern audience to understand, actually, the passion about whether there should be bishops and, and, and so on. Um, I fear that I have to say that the thing that most attracted me was the idea of a chase, um, because it, it, I, I thought that these two characters were a bit like a kind of Puritan Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. They were on the run, and there was a, a, a man in a white hat remorselessly pursuing them. The notion of retribution and not, never knowing when to stop in the search for vengeance interested me. Yeah, and I mean, you do keep the pace. I mean, it, it is a thriller. Was it a challenge? Because in real, in, I don't think it's a spoiler because the chapters go through. I mean, this is a, this is a chase that kind of goes on for yeah. decades, um, you know, 15 <coughs> years. I mean, was there a challenge as a novelist trying to keep that suspense when presumably an awful lot of... Whaley and Goff's life was... I, I mean, I, I think you do that very well. Sort of, you know, actually quite mundane being in hiding. Yes. I, I think that process is quite interesting, actually. I mean, my, one of my favourite features in journalism is that Sunday Times magazine feature, uh, A Life mm. in the Day Of. Uh, the, uh, uh, how someone spends a day is oddly compelling. And uh, in all my novels, I've always tried to give that sense of what daily life was like. Uh, I remember when I was writing about code breakers, you know, what, when did the day start? What do you do? You're a code breaker. I mean, what on earth does that mean? You come in and sit down, and then what happens? You know? And these code breakers were quite reluctant, this was 30 years ago, to, to actually say what they did, but I liked the daily details. So that helped carry me through. I think the experience of lockdown also helped me because these guys had to hide. There was a price on their head. They, they couldn't show their faces. They hid in attics and cellars, um, barns, or they, they had to hide in the open uh, in all weathers. Um, and that sense of isolation and of time just not dragging slowly, actually, but rather becoming formless and actually slipping away. And the vividness of the nights when nothing happens during the day. I was able to use all that. Because it's also set in quite, well, it shifts. I mean, some of the action is in Old England, but most of the action is in New England, if yeah. you like. Um, so in a way, presumably you had to reimagine what, you know, these terms that are now quite familiar, Boston, Cambridge, New Haven, Connecticut, but what those look like within only decades of English settlement? Yes, that was the thing. That was one of the reasons I was attracted to uh, Whaley and Goff, um, was the fact that they traversed New England at a time when it just consisted of these tiny settlements, 50, 100 houses, uh, isolated, surrounded by um, empty, emptiness with some Native American tribes, uh, and that clinging to life, uh, and the, the religious fanaticism. One of the things that I realized as I was writing was that I was writing a book about the DNA of America, really, as it was laid down, um, that uh, it was a society that in, in which an extreme form of religion entwined with politics from the start. And, uh, you know, the millennialist beliefs, uh, the beliefs that Christ would return in 666, 1666, um, 
which the religious right in America believe, of course, in that they support Israel in part because of the rapture and that this is the key to the second coming and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I was writing my novel, The Ghost, um, the one that's not about Tony Blair, uh, I went to Martha's Vineyard, I remember, and found that, to my horror, the town I was staying in was dry. You couldn't get a drink. Um, and these legacies of, the, of Puritan times, you can buy an assault rifle, but you can't buy a glass of beer until you're 21. I mean, a lot of this comes from that period. I notice, it's, I won't spoil, because it is a brilliantly dramatic ending, but I think the final sentence manages to have religion, love, wilderness and guns. And yes. Thought, yes you know, I'm just... glad you saw that. I worked very hard to yeah. get that last sentence, yep. and I appreciate the fact that someone has spotted yep. what I was trying to do. Yes, exactly. That's what, that's what I mean. It's, you don't need to rub people's nose with it. It's just, you know, the modern resonance is just kind of there. But one of the interesting dynamics as a historian that I think, you know, you pick up really well is that because these are self contain settlements whose legal status isn't always yet set in stone and frankly everybody in London's had enough on their plate for the last two decades with civil war and republic than worrying about the legal status of these colonies. There's quite a lot of scope for the colonial administrators in New England to respond as they wish to either the civil war or the republic or the restoration um, and that gave you quite a lot of scope. Yes. I mean, it happened in real life so I mean you, yes. weren't, you weren't very but as a novelist it gave you quite a lot of scope. Oh yes no, the politics is fascinating. I mean the extent to which the English revolution failed in England but sailed on in America uh, and the personnel the Cromwellians, the people who fought with the New Model Army, the Whaley and Gough, when they arrive in New Haven, drill the militia, and it, they are reported to have said, with 200 such men, we need not fear the King of England. You know, uh, the, the, the stirrings of, of 1776 were, were already there. Uh, and yes, the, uh, uh, the, governors, the governor of uh, Massachusetts welcomed uh, Whaley and Gough with open arms. They, they had assumed names. They travelled under assumed names on the ship when they fled England. When they arrived, they ad admitted who they were and said uh, if, if they were asked again, they would still cut the king's head off. They, the, then they ventured from Cambridge, Massachusetts to Boston and were recognised and they had to scarper quickly and not long after that they had to take to their heels out of Massachusetts because it was too hot for the governor of Massachusetts any longer to shield them. So they fled to Connecticut. Again, a sympathetic governor, Winthrop, but a shrewd politician who saw that if he offered them sanctuary, uh, they'd all be in trouble. So they had to move on again. Uh, all of that was very interesting. The reluctant, and there, there, there is no modern state of New Haven, which there should have been, but they were the ones who really stuck their neck out. So quite a lot of the novel is about memory as well. I mean, quite recent memory in these cases of how people, um, you know, choose to remember the past or whether they have this sort of official injunction to forget it. Um, Whaley and Goff are not quite household names, but they're much no. better known in America. Um, yes. And in a way, quite a lot among historians is known about the way that, um, you know, quite a lot is read into their decision to flee and they're seen as kind of proto-revolutionaries, you know, probably way too, in a distorted way. But, you know, did it, did it make you think about how, as a popular culture, we remember the civil wars or don't remember them or forget? I mean, maybe the act of oblivion that all these contemporaries were in join to observe, maybe it's worked, maybe we don't remember the I think I think you're right, I think there is a curious um, a reluctance to talk about it, I mean it's all Tudors and Nazis really, history, I mean I've got nothing against the Tudors but uh, obviously, uh, and certainly nothing against Nazis, uh, but, uh, well I have, but you know what I'm saying, <laughs> sorry, that's the sort of thing that could be quoted out of context. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, but this is a fascinating period. I mean, you know, England was a republic for 11 years in the 17th century and um, 150 years before the French Revolution, 250 years before the Russian Revolution. And uh, as Cromwell said, we will cut off the king's head with a crown upon it. They could have just got rid of the king and done a deal with some relative of his, but no, he went, it went, uh, the bishops went, the House of Lords went, it was a proper revolution. And uh, 
uh, it's been strange bringing out this book at the time of the death of the Queen and the accession of another Charles. Uh, the language, the, uh, the Privy Council oaths, the uh, endless detail about the Church of Scotland and the Protestant religion and so on. Uh, but you can see that uh, it is buried. Um, I think that people, members of the Cromwell family, I think, changed their names, didn't they? Quite a f some of them. And uh, it's it, sort of thing. It's yeah. kind of civil war reenactments. You talk about like the American Revolution or the French Revolution. Those are quite yeah. you know, totemic in the national imagination. Whereas I think you know we've kind of made ours safe. You know, if you do the old yeah. sealed knot reconstruction, I don't. I don't yes, it's it's, it's a little bit Morris dancey, isn't it? And. Um, uh, a drink at the pub and then out with a pike. And, uh, it, yes, it's, it's odd because it was... Um, I feel terrible saying to this because you're so much more of an expert than I am. I feel that I've, Let me tell you about the <laughs> 17th more century converts, winner of yeah, the Wolfson yeah. Prize. Uh, but the... <laughs> yes, I will. Okay, if you insist. But, I mean, it was the time when England became a military superpower in a way. The new model army was the greatest army in the world. Huge tens of thousands of men, incredibly disciplined, astonishing fighting force. The navy was very powerful. They had an expansionist now religious philosophy, Western design, moving out across America into the Caribbean and all that. Uh, so this is the beginning of the British Empire, really. This is the beginning. This is, don't you think, to some degree? Except the that it was all turned back. Except yeah. that the whole of the restoration was an yes. attempt to sort of turn the clock back and um, forget that this happened. I mean, I think that's the really powerful thing that I think comes through about if you can make a whole nation forget... Yes. And, you know, the countries you look around the world that have tried to do that, it, 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 it's, it's quite hard to get a nation to forget that kind of level of division. Yes, and I, I, uh, it was interesting, and I think it's, historical ac it's historically accurate, I hope it is, that Clarendon, Sir Edward Hyde, mm -hmm. he did not like all this hunt for, yeah. the, for the regicides. The original idea was that only four of them would be made examples of, and it ended up being dozens. And... Uh, and it dragged on and on. And so I set up a bit of a tension between him, who's the boss of my regicide hunter, who's like a clockwork bunny, you know, you can't stop him. And Hyde's going, you know, we've caught enough of this guy. <laughs> yes, we've had enough hanging, drawing and quartering, thank you very much. And I think uh, the king was broadly I think you do. sympathetic I mean, you, you, to that too. You do it very... It, it's theatre as well. I mean, yeah. I think there is a sort of demand for initial theatre of... Yeah setting scores and it's not for the faint-hearted the descriptions of the executions they're they're pretty gruesome um but accurate yes. um <laughs> well it's funny it's isn't it people say hanging drawing and quartering and virtually nobody ever really stops to think what it actually means so uh yeah what's behind it i mean you yeah. do need to get the entrails out you do need to get you know yeah 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 and you have to have and there's tens of thousands of people watching i mean this is an extraordinary ritual then and the one of the things that was amusing for me, obviously, was then to have these people, the, uh, the Christian uh, uh, settlers, all, all, all travelling through, talking about the terrible heathen Indians <laughs> and how they're not at all civilised, um, coming from a culture that does that. Yeah. yeah, and I notice when you're also describing, not sparing any blushes, um, you know, what actually happens at these traitors' deaths, you also have Naylor kind of surveying the crowd, and you can just see one or two that, you know, as you say something like, you know, but for some nimble footwork or something, that would have been on that side. Um, you know, there's quite a lot of chance, well, it's either chance or it's providence going on here, a sense that but for that well-timed approach or but for this, you know, that you could easily have been on the wrong side or that what, it, what turned out to be the wrong side. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, um, obviously, a lot of them, a, a lot of the people that signed the death warrant tried to pretend that they'd been forced to do it. Well, Inglesby famously said that Cromwell forced his hand on the paper, and then the death warrant, unfortunately for him, was discovered about three it's weeks later. Tough. Yes, and, and, and um, there were a perfectly neat signature and a seal put next to it. But Cromwell certainly did mark, frog march or make some of them sign it, and that would they sign their own death warrant as a result. Uh, I mean, he, said, he, he stood outside the Commons chamber and said... Uh, I'll go in and I will have their hands, you know, you, 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 come on, and off they had to go. And, uh, 
that was chance. I mean, um, you, you could, I can imagine myself, you know, trying to uh, ease my way. <laughs> no, Cromwell spotted you, come this way. Uh, so, yes, there was a lot of chance, I think, uh, with that. And, of course, a lot of them were very eager. Um, I put two of them in the, in the novel, um, uh, Ashley Cooper and... Uh, the other, I forget the other one, uh, Ashburn, was it? They were Cromwellians who, who now were uh, on the Privy Council and desperate to show their zeal for hunting down their own comrades. Worst of all <laughs> is Downing, one of the great villains of all time. How appropriate the street should be named after him. Uh, he, he was a real uh, uh, snake. Because he not only turned sides, yeah. but then... Betrayed his yes, he's, colleagues. he was at he attended Harvard College. He was trained to be a Puritan minister. When the Civil War started, went back, uh, was taken up by John, John Oakey, Colonel, was chaplain to his regiment. Cromwell liked him. He was made ambassador to the Hague. And uh, then when then when Cromwell fell, he started passing on secrets to Hyde and Charles. And then he was made ambassador. <laughs> to The Hague again, and then he lured his c former comrades, including Oki, uh, to a meeting where they were betrayed and they were hanged, drawn, and quartered. And they were in Oki was talking about him on the scaffold, mm. this black hearted villain. So, yes, it was nimble footwork to uh, survive the whole thing. Um, and uh, I, I, but I think, in a way, that the legislation did what it was meant to do. It, it did draw a line under it. And uh, the fact is uh, that Cromwell ran an efficient government, really. Pretty good. I mean, it's in Pepys's diary, isn't it? They're lamenting business is not as well done as it was in Oliver's time. Um, so you'd have been a roundhead? No. Well, I always thought I'd be a roundhead until I started writing about the Puritans. Then I decided I'm one of life's cavaliers, you know, wine, women and song. Uh, uh, there's, I would have been a moderate parliamentarian, i.e. I would have been squashed flat in the <laughs> middle of the road, um, I'm sure. Because, of course, one thing I realised after I'd finished the book is that Whaley and Goff, in their way, represent the two wings of the army. Uh, one that Cromwell naturally mastered, the other of which he always had to court, the religious zealots, um, but for whom he might well have become king, I suppose. Uh, do you think? I don't know. He, he obviously wanted it at any rate, despite yeah. his protestations so to the country. these big characters, I mean, they all have, and in a way, because you skillfully are sort of approaching them through, you know, documented characters or, and one invented characters. You know, you do get sideline views of Cromwell, some, often through memory of, of Wally particularly, but um, Charles I, Charles II. Did your views on these figures change from the... <coughs> you started with? It did a bit, yes. I thought that... Uh, I think Cromwell is much more uh, devious than I thought, far more of a pragmatist than I realised and ambitious. Um, I mean, you don't get to be the military dictator of the country <laughs> by chance, by just God, uh, you know. Uh, I think you ha yes. Uh, and um, the, the savagery of the expedition to Ireland, the cheerfulness with which he embraced slaughter on the battlefield, for a modern reader, I think, seen close up, uh, that... I, 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 I could, I, having said that, he was clearly a great man, in capital G, capital M. But it's astonishing that there's a statue to him outside the Houses of Parliament, given that no one treated Parliament worse than Cromwell, far worse than Charles did. And Charles I, um, uh, I think everyone says how brilliant he was at, on the scaffold and uh, how bravely he died, just like the regicides, actually, with a total belief that he was going straight to God and he had been completely right. But the uh, skill at the trial, and I thought, I mean, there are some people who say, oh, the trial of Charles I, this is the beginning of the Nuremberg trials and the, and the Hague war crimes trials. Well... He wasn't told what he was, charges he was facing. He wasn't given any legal representation. He wasn't allowed to call any witnesses. 
Um, I thought that that was a pretty uh, sham drumhead um, trial, actually. Mm. And again, Cromwell very much, I think, drove that through. So I, I, I tried to be neutral in the book. You know, you follow one side and then the other, go back and forth between them. It's not my position or my job to arbitrate the Civil War. We have one character at one point saying, is it? Francis Gough's uncle. Oh, I see both sides. That's just my undoing or something. Yes. It probably is an era in which you can't see both sides, or at least if you do, it makes for a difficult... You know, it, in a way, you, you envy William Gough's yes. you know, total belief that 1666 will happen, and even when it doesn't, it must be because the, cal you know, the calendar's been calculated <laughs> wrongly or something. Yes. You know. yes. I mean, I ended up with a lot of sympathy for Whaley. Yeah. Or, or as I th thought of him all the way through writing the book, Wally without spotting that his crest was three whales. spouting whales, uh, so that it would have spared me a lot of anxiety of avo avoiding lines of dialogue like, where's Wally? <laughs> um, I could, I could, where's Whaley? I could have got away with. Unfortunately, the audio book has been recorded as Colonel Wally, so um, it's <laughs> unfortunate. It Wally, but I, I, don't I think it's that Wally. That's Let's keep with yeah. you. You've got the Wolfson Prize. If you say it's Wally, it's Wally, no, no, as far not. as I'm concerned. He's not in there. <laughs> He's oh. not in Devil Land. You've also got a description of, or it's a memory, isn't it? Because you've got this, I don't, don't think this is a spoiler, but I mean, one thing that Whaley, Wally, the, the older one, Edward, does to, uh, to spend the time is, is ima you have him imagining writing memoirs, yes. which is presumably a way of, of thinking back. And actually, it's, it's something we know regicides did. Um, you know, both Goff and, and Ludlow as well, you know, wrote memoirs. Um, and in those memoirs, you know, he's thinking back. So Cambridge gets a kind of, yes. know, particularly about, you know, sort of the iconoclasm and things <coughs> you know, right here in Cambridge. But that's not something, if you live in Cambridge, one is ever, no. again, we've kind of airbrushed that bit out of our town. It's interesting, it? isn't it? Or I think the, head, the skull has now been taken out of the master's safe, hasn't it, in uh, it's, well, the, Sydney Cromwell, Sussex? It's, uh, as, a, as an alumnus of Sydney Sussex, uh, it's buried in, some, in, a, in, a, in an um, indeterminate spot yeah. near the chapel. This was a thing, you know, just slightly tangentially. Um, w my character, Naylor, not only is after the regicides, he's also tasked with digging up the bodies of mm. Cromwell, Ireton and Bradshaw from Westminster Abbey. They were then taken to... They were dragged on hurdles, just like if, if they were going to be hanged, drawn and quartered, to Tyburn. They were hanged. How you hang a rotting body, I don't know, but they did. And then the heads were cut off, and the heads were taken to Westminster Hall, put on poles, and stayed there for decades. And I've often, I've, it wasn't until I actually started really look, thinking what this meant. When the heads were put on poles, the poles weren't like that. They were like that, over the city gates or whatever. Uh, so the heads would have been on like that, and it would have been looking down. And Westminster Hall was where all the law courts met. So for decades after the Restoration, after 1661, uh, law was transacted under the uh, m kind of mummified or rotting head of Oliver Cromwell, Ireton, and Bradshaw. That is... And they would blow down in storms and... One of the most... Um, it's an extraordinary <laughs> thought, isn't it? It is extraordinary. No, one of, and, and tangentially too, but one of, the, you know, one of my first terms as an undergraduate, I remember going to a talk about Cromwell's head by the college archivist in Sydney, Sussex, and I didn't realise that as one of his sort of, you know... Um, nuisances was the number of rival heads that would you know keep being presented yes. to college here's the real one and he said oh they're very easy to dismiss very few heads have suffered that kind of trauma you know it's been embalmed yes. it's been it's been buried with this great state funeral or quasi state yeah. funeral um then it's exhumed then it's cut off then it's stuck on a pole then it blows down you know whatever there's you know to, to recreate that amount of trauma is, is actually yes. difficult yes um, but it is and it's it's it is an important point isn't it that you know it wasn't just a manhunt for these regicides that were still living it's, you know, inflicting the same choreography of execution and a traitor's death on the corpses. But also even those that were in prison for life still went yes. through this. So, I mean, in a way, there's this odd paradox, isn't there? The, the, the country's being told it must forget, you know, that you must yes. never mention the civil wars. That everything's going to be put into oblivion. But every 30th of January, you've got to remember <laughs> the regicides. So you've got to both forget and remember. And every 30th of January, that's when the regicides were sort of hauled out of prison. The ones yes, marched to uh, Tyburn or dragged to Tyburn with a rope 
placed around their necks, standing under the scaffold, their faces smeared with blood, and the, the passers-by, or the crowd, pelting them with things. So uh, life meant life in those days. I don't think anyone sentenced to life imprisonment uh, was ever let out, and they lived in the most... Except for this ritual. Except which, for this, yeah. this ritual. Uh, so yeah, no, they, they made. It, I think it just shows how what a what a monstrous crime regicide was considered. That 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 alone was unpardonable, really. So do you think? I mean, you can't rewrite history. Any you know, historian, that's that's you're not allowed to do that. But maybe as a novelist, you can. Um, but I, re I remember Charles Spencer saying when he wrote that Killers of the King that th it was a mistake. You know that actually really Charles should just have been taken out quietly somewhere, some court-martial or some sort of quick, quiet... Charles the First. Charles the First. Oh, definitely, yes. You, you think that? I, I do, I do, because the, um, you know, by the end of the first day, people were saying, God save the king. I mean, he, uh, uh, he, he was brought up, didn't know, into this vast space, all hundreds of judges, hundreds of spectators, a hundred and something judges, most of whom he had no idea who they were. And then they read all this, you're, you're kind of charged of treason and so on and so forth. How do you plead? Uh, and he thought very quickly and he said, effectively, before we get on to how I plead, by what right am I brought here? What is the law that is... And, it was a, and they had no answer to this question. And they, he'd said it again on the Monday. That was on the Saturday, then on the Monday, then on the Tuesday. By the Wednesday, they, he wasn't in court anymore. Uh, and they, the judge, they, they heard uh, the evidence against him in secret. They only brought him out then to um, pronounce sentence. Uh, so I think it was a pretty uh, shabby business, and it's established... Um, I think it made it possible for Charles II to come back, actually. Uh, it was It was a... A huge mistake. One of the great things about uh, writing the novel was that this Edward Whaley, who was at uh, Emmanuel College and his cousin Cromwell at Sydney Sussex, at the same time, uh, I'm sure they were close friends. They can't not have been, given the way that Cromwell made him commander of a troop of cavalry and later commissary general of horse. Uh, one of the things was that Whaley, Wally, had um, custody of the king yes. for eight months. No p person on the parliamentary side probably knew Cromwell better or had spent more time with the king. So, yes, I thought that he would well write a memoir. I mean, he had nothing else to do um, <laughs> in his attics and, and cellars. I thought it, it was relatively plausible that he would. And quite cathartic, the whole sort of process yeah. of sort of thinking it through. I'm going to move to questions in a minute. I've got one more question, because this is all, there's lots of religious men, fighting men. I mean, it's, you know, it's also a manhunt. But there are quite compelling female characters in this as well that, that surprised me in a way. You know, I thought in a way, I just wondered if you wanted to conclude before I open this up on, you know, they're, they're, they're minor characters, but yes, quite important. Well, the um, Goff... Whaley was a political moderate. He was, mari uh, he was uh, opposed Cromwell's expedition, punitive expedition to Ireland. Uh, he was a fancy dresser. The levellers were very suspicious of him. Uh, he liked horse racing, as indeed did Cromwell. Uh, Goff, his son-in-law, a very different kettle of fish, uh, uh, spoke at the Putney debates, uh, had visions, God telling him that Charles Stuart, the man of blood, they shouldn't do deals with and so on. But Goff, therefore, was a much harder character to like, but he had one very redeeming feature. He uh, loved his wife very much and his children, and he had to leave her. She was still in her 20s, 26, I think, when he left. He was at 42. Uh, he left her with five young children, the youngest a baby he'd never even seen, <laughs> born after he'd gone on the run. And there are very tender and touching letters between him and Francis, Whaley's daughter. And I thought that I must make her a character because she was... The regicides lost all their property, all their families were lost everything. They lived in very straitened circumstances. Uh, and she lived and brought these children up through the plague and through the Great Fire of London and kept collecting money and sending it to her husband. And so I thought, I must put her in. I must show this. And the other thing that really struck me about writing the novel was that 
everyone seems to have a second wife. The first wife has always died in childbirth. I mean, it, not always, but, but 75% of cases. And one of the regicides on the eve of his execution, and this is true, contemplating this appalling fate of castration and disembowelment and the rest of it, said, well, is it any worse than what every ordinary woman goes through in childbirth? Several times over sometimes. Yeah, and, and one of them actually did note that fact, and I thought again... To give a round of picture of the society, its violence, the pain, uh, the death, the grief that meant religion was a vital force. A necessity of life was to have some religious faith. Uh, and that is very hard for us to grasp, but I thought that putting her in uh, was one way of trying to convey that. I think it, it really works. Um, I'm going to open this up now uh, to a discussion, um, questions from any audience members. I think there are some members of the union with microphones, if you can just wait until a microphone comes to you. But yes, you've got one here. Um, then everybody should be able to sort of hear your question. We didn't have microphones in my day, I can tell you that. Or you just enunciate. <laughs> Well, I, I, uh, I defer to the, uh, uh, <laughs> the true expert. But the, uh, I think that, uh, well, first of all, it was fine to say, let's have a republic. And they would kind of, you know, they cut off his head on the Monday or Tuesday, was it? And on the kind of Wednesday or Thursday, the Council of State meets and, uh, and they try to actually run the country just with politicians and army officers. And... Uh, it's a, nobody really can, nobody can follow it. There's a sort of, there's a power vacuum. And because Cromwell was a, a, not only a brilliant general, but actually he was a most formidable character, even his enemies kind of had a grudging respect for him, uh, he stepped into the power vacuum and he is uh, your highness and he lives in the royal palaces he is to all intents and purposes the king but the moment he's dead the power vacuum reappears and uh, the country starts to sink into a kind of into army factionalism uh, and, and the rather unlikely figure of general monk puts an end to that and the country just swings like that and you know there's only one solution we need a figure and this has been a determining factor in our history, I think. We tried a republic, and it didn't work. And although one is logically, one believes in a republic, and anyone should be heads of state, and so on and so forth, the truth is uh, that I'm glad I don't live in America where the Trump might be my king, elected king, as it were. It's quite good to have the state separated from... Liz Truss, and God help us. Um, it's, it's, it's good to know that, <laughs> that there's this other thing. And uh, I, I, just before he died, a week before he died, I found myself in conversation with Eric Hobsbawm, the great Marxist historian, who, said, uh, who never sent back his communist membership card because he said he didn't know where to send it. <laughs> uh, but he said uh, the best societies to live in, in his view, looking around the world, were constitutional monarchies because they had offered the best guarantee of freedom. Uh, and I think, uh, I think there may be something in that. This one over there. Uh, yeah, um, I haven't quite had time to read Act of Oblivion yet, so I won't ask about that, um, but I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, but I'm a big fan of your other work, and I was just wondering which had been your favourite book to write and, and why? Well, this is like choosing between one's children. Uh, <laughs> they're all annoying in their way. Um, I suppose uh, that I've, I have nostalgia for particular books, I suppose Fatherland because it started me off. I enjoyed writing Pompeii very much. Uh, I think the best of them probably, I've also a great affection for Conclave, the novel about the election of a Pope. But I suppose An Officer and a Spy, the one about the Dreyfus Affair is 
probably the most successful as as a work uh, uh, simply because it represented the absolute acme of what I try to do which is that every word in it or everything in it is historically accurate uh, every character existed I use all the documents all these quotations from the trials and the court martials and so on and yet the whole thing because it's an invented memoir is entirely fictitious so every word in it is false and every word of it is true and that kind of uh, that represents for me probably the uh, uh, the best that I could ever hope to do and I it, it was a rare thing uh, and it was also very quick I started the book on January the 15th it's 150,000 words long and it was in the shops at the end of September and even on the eve of writing it, I wasn't sure whether I'd write it in the first person and in the present tense, which I did, and, or indeed where I would start it. So, you know, it's one of those books that just sort of came, really. So I, that has a, probably the most special place. Um, and partway through the Cicero trilogy, one thing I've noticed, you're amazing at writing very formidable, brilliant characters like Caesar and Cicero. How do you build these characters and make them seem so alive? Well, that's very kind of you to say. Uh, I, uh, I've been obsessed, unhealthily obsessed with politics from a very young age. Uh, when I was six years old, this is giving you a clue to my age, uh, my parents went to uh, my infant school for the parents' evening and around the walls where everyone's work had been put up to show the parents, uh, my pet rabbit, uh, where we went on holiday. Um, I, mine was, why me and my dad don't like Sir Alec Douglas Hume? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> right from... Right from the very beginning, uh, I was always fascinated by politics. And it was, my father had had polio when he was uh, in, the, in the epidemic in the 1920s um, that took um, Franklin D. Roosevelt, but it also took my dad when he was 18 months old. And uh, so he, had, he couldn't play sport, really. He had no interest in it. Therefore, I didn't really take much interest in it. But he was obsessed with politics. And it became our football, really, as it were. And so um, I, I've always been fascinated by, the, by power and the people who pursue power and the, the fact that it always ends badly and uh, the, 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 the dark side of it, yes, of course, but also a kind of nobility about it as well. And, uh, and I'm always quite, I'm quite grateful that people want to grapple with, uh, you know, social care and all these sorts of issues. Someone has to do it and they do. And there's all the drama and excitement of it and the conspiracies. And uh, so I, I, a lot of what Cicero says about it being history on the wing and there's nothing more exciting. And, and the kind of uh, insights into power. Um, uh, Francois Mitterrand was asked what was the most uh, important quality for a statesman and he said well I'm, I'm tempted to say integrity uh, but I think it's indifference <laughs> uh, and it's just such a brilliant line and I, I really you know I just find that whole thing so it's sort of if, if I do it it's because you know it's my football I suppose. Uh, Hi there. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about your research process? You know, how do you know when enough's enough? How deep to go? Things like that, really. Well, um, first of all, I do an enormous amount of research, most of which is completely pointless. Um, if I say that I have the seven volumes of Thurlow State Papers... I'm quite jealous. <laughs> yes, well, I, I may be able to give you a second-hand copy. Uh, that then, uh, you know, you really... I mean, I read an enormous amount of stuff which just has no relevance at all. But uh, yeah, it, it's, the, it's the kind of lived life is to just immerse myself in it, to, as far as possible, then forget it. 
Uh, Tom Stoppard uh, has this great phrase, just because it's true doesn't mean it's interesting. So it's quite important to sort of, you know, let go of it. But I do, I do a lot of it. Uh, I read, I think, I think I read, read pretty well every extant speech and uh, letter of Cromwell. Not because I used them in the book, but because of the language, the rhythm of language. The, uh, I'm interested in geography, uh, where things are in relation to one another. Uh, you know, uh, in Munich, there's a lot of rooms and where people are in rooms compared, you know, the, the, the choreography, the geography of power is always interesting. Um, and I get obsessed by tiny details that are... Other, what day of the week was it? I mean, you can find out what day of the week everything was in the, in the old calendar in the 17th century. I like that. I like that they arrived on a Friday in America. Uh, and also the moon, the phases of the moon. You can have every phase of the moon in the 17th century in New England. So when I say it was a full moon or a waning moon or whatever it is, it really was. I mean, this level of nerdish detail um, uh, helps me. And if I can, if I can feel it's true, then, uh, then I have a, a decent chance of convincing the reader. I've never used a researcher uh, because you'd miss the little, tiny little things um, that make a book. I mean, I wanted to find out everything I could about Whaley and Goff. Whaley and Goff pop up in the diary of John Evelyn in 1657, there was, he went to celebrate Christmas Mass in a private chapel on the Strand, and uh, the priest was had just done the sacrament, and the doors burst open, and in poured soldiers, and were followed later by Colonel Wayne and Colonel Goff, who were in command of them, and they interrogated the congregation, to, to, to told them off for for celebrating Christmas, which was illegal. Uh, some of them were arrested. And um, I, put, I thought, I'll put Richard Naylor in that congregation, the man who eventually is on the tail of, on their tail, so that there's a personal kind of animus. Only by this kind of crazy amount of uh, research would one get that idea, and yet in a way, the whole book turns on that one episode. Yeah, there's one here. <coughs> Hi, um, thank you so much for, for this talk. Um, I was so curious to hear um, whether there are any uh, current day or perhaps historical figures that you feel merit a sort of novel that you haven't written yet, but yet you would be especially keen uh, to write, besides Tony Blair, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in the Roman world, I've always been very interested in Agrippa. Um, and his relationship with Augustus, and sometimes I think that that would be quite a good novel to write. I have this theory that Agrippa really ran everything, and Augustus was just the the front man who, who had the connection to Caesar. But because the energy and the domination of Agrippa, who won all the battles, built the warships, built the aqueducts, everything, you can't help but feel that he's the real power. Uh, and that would be quite interesting uh, to write it about. I, uh, you know, it's very, I mean, I'm quite interested in, in, the, in England at the beginning of the First World War, and the character, character of Asquith, uh, also in his relationship with Venetia Stanley, is something I quite, I keep thinking there's a novel there, but I can't quite get it, you know. Uh, but I never throw anything away. I, I, you know, you have ideas. I had an idea for a ghostwriter, writing a novel about a ghostwriter a decade before I did it. Uh, I wanted to write a novel about a Munich agreement uh, before I even wrote Fatherland uh, because I found the character of Chamberlain very interesting. I, I've, I'm, I'm interested in reviled figures, actually, and... I thought there must be more to him than, than we're told in this Churchillian version of history. And so I wanted to write about a private secretary who flew with him to meet Hitler. And, but I couldn't find a way to make the novel work until I suddenly realised, of course, 
I would have to also see it from the German side. And then I thought, why doesn't a young German travel at the same time as the young Englishman? And then they were at Oxford together, I imagined, and then they meet in Munich. Suddenly the whole novel, I had it, you know. So, um, you, know, I never, you never know what's going to work and what's going to happen. And that's part of the pleasure. I mean, I don't write about myself. I don't write about my struggle in the Nottinghamshire Council House to eventually get to the Cambridge Union. Uh, it's a, it, it's a, it's interests me, possibly, but I don't think it would interest anyone else. So, uh, you know, I turn my interest outwards, and so there's a, any number of stories one could write about. I never expected to write about two Puritan colonels running across New England, I can assure you. Uh, so any, anything is possible. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, couldn't see. Um, have you ever experienced writer's block? And if so, how did you overcome it? Well, I did have a very bad writer's block on my second novel, Enigma. Uh, Fatherland had been a great success, and I, hadn't, I didn't really know quite why it had been such a success, except that I... I wasn't really going to be come up with an idea quite as good as that, probably ever again in my life. So I started on a novel about code breaking. I have no mathematical knowledge or skill whatsoever. And it was quite, it's quite hard to write a novel about code breaking, especially when you're anxious about why, how, what it was that had made the first book successful. So that book really stalled for about a year. And... Uh, I, on what happened, oddly enough, was I read the letters of Raymond Chandler, and Chandler he just says to some, writes to someone and says, I cannot understand writers who complain about writing, because surely it's the most wonderful thing to do. Uh, it seems a banal thing, but it pierced me, because I thought, you know, yes, that's right. Why? I shouldn't complain about it. This is the most lucky thing to do. And it, it did sort of break a barrier in it. I, I relaxed into it. I thought I should enjoy it. And by and large, that's what I've done. Even when novels have been tough, uh, I've always actually been glad that I've been writing. And that's, that's got me through it. But uh, writer's block is a real thing. And I chiefly have overcome it, I suppose, by the fact I was a journalist and... Uh, I believe in the adrenaline of deadlines. And so my poor publishers find themselves told in January that I will deliver a book in June for publication in September. And we all go on a white knuckle ride together. And I sort of have to write 800 words a day. And uh, the cover is designed and the marketing proceeds and the translations going on simultaneously and I have to keep on doing it. I make my life as difficult as possible to force myself to write. If I didn't do that, I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning, you know, like anybody else. There's nothing more easy to postpone and put off the writing, be it a thank you letter, an email. Supervision essay. Supervision essay, gone on, yes. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. <laughs> uh, yes, so, uh, yes, fear, I think. Fear and enjoyment, a curious entwining of the two keeps me going. Time for one more. Yeah, I think there was one up here. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so, two of my favourite books of all time are Archangel and Fatherland. And I just wanted to ask what those two books mean to you. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Uh, Fatherland, uh, well, Fatherland utterly changed my life. Uh, you know, uh, I had the idea of the 1980s. Uh, uh, when Germany was just a very powerful country in the world and I... I wonder what the world might have been like if they'd won. Uh, I'd written a non-fiction book called Selling Hitler, uh, in which I had uh, uh, read Hitler's table talk, where he, he lays that, when he thought he was going to win the war in the summer of 1941 and 42, he expounded to his 
coterie around the dinner table what the world would look like, you know, and there was this extraordinary 20 million settlers in the Ukraine and German settlers and so on, this whole world, and I thought that would make a very good uh, non-fiction book. So I thought I'd try and write that, and I did, it got a contract for it, and uh, uh, w then I found myself asking these questions. Would 20 million Germans really have wanted to settle in the Ukraine? And uh, what would they have said about the disappearance of European Jewry? What would they, uh, assuming they couldn't beat the Americans? So would the Americans have done a deal with Hitler, just as they did with Mao and uh, with Stalin? Uh, so I found myself inventing characters uh, and a plot, and I walked through a kind of uh, looking glass into another world, and that was very exciting. And I never wrote another non-fiction book again because fiction became a tool for to express ideas. And uh, so that's what Father I'm meant to me. Not only the um, economic success of it, but the actual realization that this was the kind of writing I wanted to do. I mean, my uh, hero was George Orwell, who said famously he wanted to turn political writing into an art, by which he didn't mean make it very fancy and, and so on. He meant uh, use the tools of the imagination, creation of character, uh, a plot and so on, uh, to elevate it above uh, journalism, which political writing generally is, uh, to uh, or thesis or, or analysis to to something that was creative and uh, so Fatherland made that to me and Archangel uh, I've I've thought at the time was the best written of the books that I did actually it went with a terrific swing I've never written a book as fast as 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 that one and uh, that sense of history hanging over the present day. Uh, and a lot of what's in Archangel, you saw with Putin, has kind of come true, actually, uh, that they have not shaken off the ghosts of the past at all. Um, so I'm, pr I'm proud of that book, which was actually, to end on a Cambridge note, um, a thinly disguised a Mickey take of Norman Stone, who uh, taught, who was a history um, Don at Jesus College, and pretty politically incorrect he was too, chasing both male and female students around the table. Um, and um, he was very, very funny. Uh, so I, I based the central character on Norman Stone, who being Norman, of course, thought it was a huge joke. And um, blow me, when he died a couple of years ago, his family asked me to read a passage from the book about a history done with a hangover at his memorial service. So, <laughs> so I have, a, I have a soft spot for that book as well. Uh, lectures is a great place to end. So please join me in thanking our guests tonight. So if you join me up in the Kennedy Room, you can get copies of Act of Oblivion as well as Devil Land, and they will be up for sale there, and you can queue for a signing. Thank you very much.